we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Nah, Patrick. Orthodoxy. Uh, I don't know, SpongeBob. Orthopraxy. Nah, orthodoxy. Orthopraxy. Orthodoxy. Orthopraxy. Doxy. Proxy. Doxy. Proxy. Hey, you two. Why can't it be both? (laughs) 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 I like money. Happy New Year, everyone. So that's your favorite episode. Who, who knew that, that uh, SpongeBob uh, got into such deep theological uh, questions as, as the relationship of orthodoxy and orthopraxy? That just, I just didn't even know that. That's amazing. Welcome, everyone. I, uh, we're a little different around here, but you probably know that already. If you didn't know that, well... What took you so long to figure it out? My name is Chris. I'm, I'm so thankful that everyone's here today at Redemption Church. Glad you're here. Are you enjoying the new year so far? Yeah. All right. Good. Um, I got a question for you. It's an important question. It's a question we as a church need to be able to answer this question. Here it is. What kind of church is this? What kind of church is this? When it comes to this church, what is our identity? What is our identity based on? That's a good one. What is our identity based on? Is our identity based on denomination? Is our identity based on style or preference? You know, some people uh, describe churches with a certain style. They're they're really energetic. They've got a contemporary style of worship. Is, Is that what defines us? Or do personalities define us? Especially in the age of the megachurch, you've got these big personalities and everyone knows their names and it's like they define the church. Does that define us? What kind of church is this? What is our identity based on? Many people will ask you about your church and they'll go, well, what kind of church is that? And and here's the thing about it. They're usually asking how we worship instead of who we worship. Isn't that kind of strange? Do you agree that that's kind of strange? What kind of church is that? Oh, it's a Christian church. And they'll almost come back with, yeah, but what kind of Christian church? It's like, how do you worship? What is the worship experience like? How do you worship instead of who do you worship? I'm here to tell you right now that that is strange. The Christian church was never meant to be that. Our identity should be based on Jesus. He is the who that identifies us, defines us. Over the next weeks, we're going to be talking about our identity and our purpose as a church, but also your identity and purpose as a Christian. You have an identity and purpose for your life, all right? And it's found in Christ. And we're going to be concentrating on two theological terms over the series. Please, I don't want to lose you with these words, so let's explain them really quick. The first one is orthodoxy. Everyone said orthodoxy. orthodoxy. It means a correct belief. Correct belief. That's orthodoxy. Another word is orthopraxy. And it means correct action. Say orthopraxy. Orthopraxy. Orthodoxy, correct belief. Orthopraxy is correct action. Think of it like this. Orthodoxy is what you believe. And orthopraxy is how you live. Orthodoxy is how you think. Orthopraxy is how you act. That's orthodoxy. Orthopraxy. Let me tell you that it is not good enough to have an orthodoxy without an orthopraxy. Nor is it good enough to have an orthopraxy without an orthodoxy. Did I lose you on that? Did we get lost in the orthos? All right. 
you need to have both of those. Uh, have you ever heard someone say something to this tune? I'm spiritual, but not fill in the blank. Religious. religious. Have you ever heard that term, I, that, that phrase? I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I remember the first time someone said that to me, I'm like, what does that mean? I was clueless. I work in a church. I'm around religious and spiritual things. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they had trouble explaining it too. Uh, here's what I take it to mean, all right? And y'all can, uh, you know, may, may or may not be right, but this is how I take that term to mean. I'm spiritual but not religious. In other words, I have actions that I live by that I think are spiritual. And I live by these actions Maybe it's prayer or meditation. Uh, maybe it's some kind of morality. Maybe uh, it's generosity. Uh, and that is my orthopraxy. That is to say that is my spiritual way of living. However, I don't live by a religious set of beliefs. If asked about heaven, hell, God, or the devil, I might not know what I believe, or I might not uh, have anything to base that belief on, but just how I feel at that moment. I might come back with that question of, oh, is there a hell? Well, I don't know. Um, I hope not. I guess not. That's an example of not having an orthodoxy. That's having no uh, structure to a belief system. And it could literally change uh, with the kind of day you're having, or the way the wind is blowing, or the latest cliche you heard. So I just gave you a great example of someone that has an orthopraxy, but not an orthodoxy. They're spiritual. Oh, I do spiritual things, but I'm not religious. I, they don't have an orthodoxy. Or maybe you've heard this. We'll flip this on its head. I'm a Christian, or I'm Methodist, or I'm Baptist or I'm Pentecostal, fill in the blank. You know, there's so many denominations out there. And so they might say, I am this, I'm a Christian, or fill in that denominational blank. However, that's really news to everyone else because they, although they claim a certain orthodoxy, no one else sees an orthopraxy. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, maybe they claim an orthodoxy, a set structured belief I am in structured alliance with this denomination, but they might not be actively practicing orthopraxy. Maybe they don't go to church. Yeah, there are Christians that don't go to church. Oh, I'm Baptist. Oh, well, praise the Lord, brother. Where do you go to church? Well, I haven't been in so many years. They're all hypocrites, right? You hear this, right? I'm not the only one, right, that has heard that. Uh, so maybe they don't go to church. Uh, maybe they have sin in their life that they have no plans to ever get rid of. Maybe uh, they never pray, they never read the Bible, or they never share their faith. What is that an example of? That's an example of claiming an orthodoxy. This is my orthodoxy. That's the name of my denominational creed right there. I live by their set principles. But I may or may not live out those principles that's an orthodoxy without an orthopraxy. Do you follow me? We need an orthodoxy and we need an orthopraxy. We need both of them. Squidward was right. These altars are open. Just kidding. Not yet. And we had the best altar ever. All right. Squidward did. We need an orthodoxy and an orthopraxy. Both of these examples I give you, they don't get it done. They don't work. Everyone looks at them and goes, that's strange. Or what does that mean? Our orthopraxy, our actions, they come out of us. Would you agree? Your actions come out of you. But where does our orthodoxy come from? I really understand where our orthopraxy comes from. That's our actions. That comes straight out of us. But where does our orthodoxy come from? Correct belief should come from the Word of God. Do you agree with that? I'll add this to it. Correct belief should also come from a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
We've talked about that with, during that whole Messiah series, how Jesus, he changes everything. When we see Jesus, uh, that Revelation series, that when he shows up, it changes everything. So if, if a correct belief system, an orthodoxy, I'm telling you that it should come from the Word of God. And who is the Word of God but Jesus Christ? He is the Word wrapped in flesh. When we have a solid orthodoxy, it should then transform our orthopraxy. When we have a correct belief system that is founded on truth, not just good principles, but truth, it should transform our orthopraxy. That's our action. That's our lives. Your belief should transform your life. Your belief should transform your life. And that is true both negatively and positively. And we've seen people all throughout the religious spectrum take a set of beliefs and it transformed them one way or another. There are some negative examples of this. They have taken a belief system and they have taken that and they said, all right, I'm going to live out this belief system. And they start you know, putting bombs on their body and going blowing someone up. So there's negative examples of this too. But when we are, have Jesus as our orthodoxy, we should start putting on Christ, the Bible says, and we should start loving people. We should start forgiving people. We should start laying down our life for others. That orthodoxy should transform our orthopraxy. And when people see that, they ought to say, wow, that's really different. There's something about those people. Where does our orthodoxy come from? Our orthodoxy is the word of God. It's the word of God. And, and we let the word of God transform our lives. That's why we receive the word of God. Let's take a look at Psalm 19 and 7. Psalm 19 and 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. No, we'll just stop right there. The law of the Lord, what is that? That's the word of God, the commands of God, the orthodoxy. It's perfect. And what does it do? Does it do something? Oh, so you're saying the orthodoxy leads to an orthopraxy. The orthodoxy, the law of the Lord, revives the soul. Orthopraxy. All right, let's read on. The statutes of the Lord. Again, orthodoxy are trustworthy, making wise the simple. That's me. I'm still working on that wise part. Verse 8. Verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Verse 9. The fear... Of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. That's Psalm 19, 7 through 9. Do you see that you have an orthodoxy? And when it is founded on the word, that an orthopraxy should come out of that. Reviving the soul, making wise, bringing joy and giving light. You should be living out your orthodoxy, and it should be being lived out in you, and it should, you should be better off for the Word of God. You should be better off for God's Word. Are you today? Is that your life? Get a load of that. If, if, if you aren't better off from the Word of God, then you've got some questions to answer. Do you have an orthodoxy? Do you have an orthopraxy? You need both. Redemption Church, we want an orthodoxy. We want a correct belief. And then we want to live out that belief. That's what we want to do as a church. That is what we want to do. We want to know Jesus. We want to know Him intimately. We want to recognize Him. We want to hear His voice. We want to see Him when He shows up and go, there He is. That's Him. All right? We want that. And then we want to live out Jesus. We must do both. We must have an orthodoxy and an orthopraxy. Can I get an amen? amen? 
Every orthopraxy needs an orthodoxy. Every action needs a belief structure, right? I'm going to explain this. Acts chapter 2. If you've never read Acts chapter 2, get a load of it. Go, go, go read Acts chapter 2. It's amazing what happens. It's the birth of the church. The church is born in Acts chapter 2. They are born again, just like Jesus said we all needed to be in, in John chapter 3, verse 5. In Acts 2, it's happening. They are being born again. The church is born. The Holy Spirit is being poured out for the first time ever. The Holy Spirit is poured out on people right there, birth of the church. And guess what happened? Crazy actions followed. Crazy stuff started to happen. The, believe in, the believers in Acts 2 were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started to rejoice. And they started sharing their faith. They started actively living out Jesus. They started to worship passionately. They started to go out on the streets and worship. They started to miraculously speak in tongues. It was some crazy stuff going on in Acts chapter 2. That's some crazy orthopraxy. Look at somebody say, that's some crazy orthopraxy. They are acting a fool, they might say in, in Texas. Uh, and guess what? This crazy orthopraxy led unbelievers to say this. Acts 2 verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Can we just stop right there? Are you living out Jesus in such a way that it makes people stop? That they are perplexed? That they are amazed? And they start asking, what is that all about? That person, the way they live, what is that all about? Are you living that kind of life? Because we should be. Redemption Church, we should be living that kind of life that Plano says, what is up with them? That Irving says, what is that about? What does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Can anyone interpret that? What are they really saying? <laughs> These people are drunk. They are crazy drunk. Right? And we could see how that could be, right? Given the, the, uh, w the description I just gave to you of, of uh, the, this New Testament church in Acts 2, you could understand why they would say that. So, did these New Testament believers have... Correct orthopraxy? Did they have correct orthopraxy? I mean, they're being made fun of. They are being criticized. In fact, they're being defamed right there. These are drunkards. They're drunk people. So are they doing the right thing? Do they have correct orthopraxy? Are they maybe not doing the right actions? Because, I mean, criticism comes. How do you know if you have the correct orthopraxy? We've talked about where our orthodoxy comes from. But how do you know you have the correct orthopraxy? How do you know what you're doing is right? When someone starts saying, you're wrong. When someone starts says, you're crazy, or you're drunk, or you're stupid, or you're a religious nut, and you're using religion as a crutch. When all that stuff happens, when all those things start flying at you, and all those criticisms, how do you know your orthopraxy is right? How do you know that you're living the right way? How did people being tied to a stake, about to be burnt, know that they were living for the right thing? How did they know? How did they know? Well, in order to know your orthopraxy is right, you need to consult your orthodoxy. And what is our orthodoxy? The Word of God. If you want to know if you're doing the right things, and there, there are a lot of people, I, I, 
as a pastor, one of the major questions you get is, is this a sin? Is this a sin? Am I doing this right? Is this wrong? Is this, where's the boundaries here? Where is that? That's one of the main questions. Here's what, what I do. Hey, let's open up the Bible. Let's look at our orthodoxy. In order to know if your orthopraxy is right or wrong, you need to look at the Word of God. So watch what happens in Acts chapter 2. Remember, they've just been criticized. They've just been called drunks. Peter stands up and he says, Acts 2 verse 15, These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What he's saying is this. This is that that the prophet Joel talked about. This is that. Look at somebody say, this is that. In other words, this action, this orthopraxy, this thing that is happening and that we are doing, this action is that. It is that orthodoxy. It is that solidified belief that's found in the Word of God. It is what the prophet said. This orthopraxy is that orthodoxy. Every orthopraxy needs an orthodoxy. We don't just do things around here. We don't just live any old way. We look to the Word of God, and that Word of God transforms us. It lets us know which way to go. It lets us know what is right, what is wrong, what is black, and what is right, white. As you come to God, you may experience an orthopraxy that is not your custom. As you come to God, there might be some things you just, you have never been comfortable with. You've never done them. I don't know, Grandma's church never did this. That church I went to growing up, they never did this. This is some weird orthopraxy, I think. And the, you might... You might join the people in Acts 2 and start criticizing and say, these people are, are religious nuts or, or there's something wrong with them, right? I want to tell you that if you are, start experiencing an orthopraxy that is not your custom as you come to God, don't freak out. Don't freak out and just run away. But also don't just blindly follow. But look to your orthodoxy. If someone comes to you with some strange stuff and you, you wonder, well, should I do that? Should I do this? If you're in this church and you see people uh, worshiping a certain way and you see people coming to the altar and you see all this stuff going on, don't freak out, but don't blindly follow either. Look to your orthodoxy. Look to your word of God. That's how you know what, what not to do. Again, our orthodoxy. It is the Word of God. We let it shape every area of our life. We let it shape our orthopraxy. We do three things every time we come together. Right? We tell you every time. Three things. We do them every time we come together. Why do we do this? Why do we do these three things? What's that all about? As Peter would say, this is that. This practice, this, this, these three things that we do every time we come together, I'm here to tell you that this is that. This is that which is clearly seen in the Word of God. Let's talk about it a little bit. Worship. When we come together, everybody worships. And so they, they're singing in this house. And there is the lifting of our voices in this house. We, we shout in this house. Some people jump up and down and they get excited and they, they dance. Some people uh, lift their hands. Some people weep and cry. Some people bow down. Some people fall on their face. It happens when we're worshiping God. Some people bring offerings. What is that? That's our orthopraxy. That's what we do, but why do we do that? Well, let me tell you. It's also our orthodoxy. It's not just our action that we do. 
It's not just that we've decided to be that kind of church. It is our orthodoxy. It is in the word of God. It is clearly seen in the word of God. Let me tell you that how we worship has nothing to do with the denominational background. How we worship is not, well, we're this kind of church. How we worship is not, well, we want to appeal to this demographic of people. How we worship is, has nothing to do with that. Our worship comes straight out of Scripture. Read Psalms. They lifted their hands. They lifted their voices. They shouted to God with a voice of triumph. How we worship is straight from our orthodoxy. And that's why we do it. Our orthopraxy comes from our orthodoxy. Are you with me? You need not wonder, is this something I'm supposed to be doing? Because it is found in the Word of God. Everybody worships and everybody receives the Word of God. We're doing that right now. We look into the Word of God, also known as the Bible. We study what it says. We look deep into its context. We study the language and... Uh, and We study deeper into the language to find out its further meaning. We don't just take it at face value, but we actually look into the contextual uh, constraints of, of each scripture. And we even open our homes to connect groups each week where we look at the word of God. We don't just, you know, let it happen on Sundays at a certain time, but... We also try to memorize the Word of God. I encourage you to memorize. Every month we've got a new memory passage. I encourage you to memorize the Word of God. We try to memorize it and hide it in our hearts. We try to obey what the Word of God says. We don't do this because we think it's a hip, trendy thing to do. We don't do this because a church down the street did it, and so let's try it out. We do it because we look in the Word of God and we see this is what the New Testament church did. That they gathered together and they broke bread together and they shared the Word together and they hid the Word in their hearts and they they shared the Word and they would write it down and they would send it off and the Word would spread. We see that and every time we come together, we make sure that we do that. It is our orthopraxy, but it is also our orthodoxy. It is not just a correct practice. It is a correct belief. And every New Testament Christian should be doing this. Everybody worships. Everybody receives the word of God. Redemption Church, what is the third thing we do? Y'all can be a little bit louder than that. It's all right. Everybody talks to God. We pray to God every time we come together. Over the last year, was there ever a time we didn't invite you to come talk to God? Even at a connect group, we are talking to God. We're always talking to God. Always. Here's a little clue. Here's a little tip for you. God is alive and you can talk to him. Is there more important conversation than the conversation you're going to have with God? My goodness. We pray to God every time we come together. We offer to pray with anyone who wants prayer. We lay hands on people. What's that about? Whoa. We confess our sins to each other. We confess our sins to God and we repent. We pray for the sick. And guess what? They are healed. We pray for women understanding. And guess what? It's found. We intercede for our city, for our nation, for our world, for our homes, for ourselves. As we pray, we feel God with us. Prayer is powerful. That's our orthopraxy. We invite you every time we come together to come pray. And we ask that you, if you want special prayer, if you want us to pray with you, you come into the first two feet. And we'll pray with you. Why do we do that? We don't do this because we need some time to kill at the end of service. That's not why we do it. Uh, we don't do this um, because we're, we're just, we're trying out something new. And, uh, you know, we don't do it because Pastor Marshall, our care pastor, is an excellent prayer person. He just knows the right words to say. And he knows where to push all the these and thous and thus sayest. And praise in King James, right? No, we don't do that for that. No, although he does know some excellent King James. 
We are trying to live out what we clearly see in the word of God. I was thinking just the other day, you know, we asked you to come to the first two feet of this altar and that lets us know we want you to, you want us to pray with you. We, we do that, you know, out of comfort for you. But you know what? If you go to Israel right now and you go to the site of the temple, it's, it's no longer fully there, but there is a place called a wailing wall. And when people come to pray, they walk right up to a object and they start to pray. And they just pray out to the God of Israel. You're doing it right here. There's, we just don't have a wall. It would be hard to preach to you through the wall. I'd have to stand somewhere else. And then where would I stand? All right. But this is what we're doing. This isn't so crazy. It isn't so weird. There is so much scripture about prayer. There is so much scripture about praying for sick. If you are sick, do you know what you're supposed to do? The first thing you're supposed to do is call the doctor, right? No. Read your Bible. It says call for the elders of the church to come pray with you. I'm going to tell you something. I hear about a lot of people being sick, but I don't get enough phone calls. The Word of God says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. Call us. We'll come, not because that's just the kind of church we want to be, because we read it in the Word of God. We want the Word of God to be lived out in us. We don't just want it to be a stale old belief system. We want it to be something that we're living out actively. We want it to be an orthodoxy and an orthopraxy. That's why we do the three things every come to, we come to Redemption Church. I'm doing my best to do the second thing right now, but we're going to be doing that third thing in just a moment. I want you to come. You know, when you come, you're joining all the New Testament believers of all time you're joining those people that are gathered in Acts chapter 2 and you're calling out on the name of the Lord. This is not a weird thing. This is orthodox. This is the belief system of all belief systems. This is truth. So live it out. James chapter 1 verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Let me tell you. This is going to sound mean and nasty, but I'm just telling you what James 1.22 says, okay? So please don't think badly about Chris Fluitt. But here's what it says. It says that all over the Metroplex today, people came to church and they listened, but they deceived themselves. They lied to themselves. Why did they lie to themselves? Was it bad that they heard the word of God? No, it was bad that they heard the word of God and then didn't do what it said. If you are hearing this message today, if you're hearing the word of God today, but you aren't doing what it says, what's another way to say you're deceiving yourself? You're lying to yourself. That's pretty serious. You would get all been out of shape. You have gotten all been out of shape when someone's lied to you. I've seen some of your Facebook posts, all right? You get really angry when someone lies to you. Well, you're lying to yourself every time you hear the word of God, but don't do something about it. Let me tell you, this is a strong sentence when you get ready. It is not enough to point to the Bible and say, I believe it. It's not enough to say, I believe that book right there, the Bible, believe that. If you don't live it, that is not enough. Not only do you need to believe it, you need to let it be your correct belief system, your orthodoxy, but you need it to be the lifeblood in you. You need it to be every word out of your mouth. You need it to wash your mind with the word of God. You need it to be your orthopraxy. You need it to be your action. You need it to be your practice. Or orthodoxy forms our orthopraxy. But the way we live should reflect what we believe. Jesus in John chapter 5, 39 through 40. I've read the scripture so many times in my life. Every time I've read it, it's like, oh, wow, that really happened just like that. Here it is. Jesus was speaking to men who knew the word of God better than any of us. He was talking to some Pharisees. They were religious leaders. And they didn't just know orthodoxy. 
they defined it. I want you to get this picture. They were, they were religious leaders that were more orthodox than any of us could think about ever being. But look what Jesus says to them in verse 39. He says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Verse 40 says, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus says something very important here. I don't want you to miss it. Scripture in and of itself does not give eternal life. Word of God's powerful. Word of God will change your life. That's why we do it every time we come to, to, together. But the Word of God by itself will not save you. The Word of God by itself does not bring eternal life. I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that. As important as Scripture is, and you better believe, it's important. Don't think for a second I'm saying it's not important. But as important as it is, Sean, it merely testifies of Christ. The importance of Scripture is not in and of itself. The importance is who it points to. The importance is that it leads us to Christ. The importance is that it bears witness and testifies so we can know Jesus Christ. It leads you to Christ. And you want to know where eternal life is? It's not in a book. It's in Jesus. It's not in a church denomination. It's in Jesus. It's not in a worship service. It's in Jesus. Worship, all that stuff is great, but eternal life is only found in Jesus. Do you want to experience eternal life? You need Jesus. You need to know Him you need to let him be your belief system and you need to start living him out because that's eternal life right there. Here are these men that know scripture. They know more scripture than all of us put together and I don't hesitate in saying that. They can quote all of the Old Testament. They know orthodoxy. They know scripture. However, they don't recognize the Lamb of God. They don't see the light of the world standing right in front of them. They don't understand that the Messiah, Jehovah God, wrapped in flesh, is standing right in front of them. And although they know Scripture, what they end up living out, their orthopraxy, in that moment is that they reject Jesus. They reject him to the point of putting him on the cross. They reject him to the point of scorning him. They reject him to the point of laughing at him. How do you know if you have the correct orthodoxy? We... We asked, how do you know you have the correct orthopraxy? It's the word of God. It's the orthodoxy. You always need to consult your orthodoxy. But, I mean, we kind of take it for granted. Yeah, the word of God is true. But let's get real, Pastor. I mean, I sometimes wonder if God's real. I sometimes wonder if the Bible really is the word of God. How do you know if you have the correct orthodoxy? You listen to me right now because I want you to know the answer to this question. The answer to this question is found in, in, in John chapter 5, 39 and 40, I believe. Because these Pharisees, they had orthodoxy. And guess what? It was even founded on the correct belief system. It really was. But, how do you know you have the correct orthodoxy? Here it is. It transforms your life. It transforms your actions. When you find the right truth and you embrace it, you are no longer the same person. Those that are in Christ are a new creation. Old things have passed away. When, how do you know you have the correct orthodoxy? Your orthodoxy 
changes you. And they stood right at this crossroads of their orthodoxy and remained unchanged. So I ask you right now, do you have the correct orthodoxy? When was the last time you let the Lord Jesus Christ change your life? When was the last time you let Him change that bitter attitude you have towards someone? When was the last time you let Him work out mercy, grace, and love in you? When was the last time you let Him work out patience in you? When was the last time you let Him work out His Spirit in you? When was the last time? Because that's how you know you have the correct orthodoxy orthodoxy. Is it spiritually correct to come to church and worship? You, you better believe it. Is it spiritually correct to come to the church and worship the way we did? Yeah, absolutely. Is it spiritually correct to study the word like we have today? Yeah. Is it spiritually correct to come and spend some time on the altar? You better believe it. Is it spiritually correct to come and receive communion and all these things? You better believe it. However, there's something wrong if it's not changing you from the inside out. There is something wrong if it's not changing you from the inside out. Redemption Church, you should be ever changing as you come in contact with the truth of Jesus. You should be changed from the inside out. The Bible says that you're changed from glory to glory to glory. You just never stop changing. I want you to take a big look at your life today. Are you letting this orthodoxy change your orthopraxy? Is it transforming your life? Is it changing how you live? Is it changing who you're living for? Redemption Church, who are we living for? If you have knowledge of Scripture, but don't have an encounter with God, you're doing something wrong. We're about to open this altar, and my prayer is that you have an encounter with God. My prayer today is not that you enjoyed the sermon, or that you go, Pastor, I believe what you said, or, or anything like that. I pray that you have an encounter with God, because that's what it was all about. Those Pharisees didn't understand it. The reason they were reading scripture was that so when they come face to face with Jesus, they could encounter him. They didn't get it and they rejected him. I'm telling you today, if you walk out of this place without an encounter with God, you are doing the same thing. If you came to church today, and fulfilled all the commandments of the Pharisees. Yet you stand in the presence of Jesus. And you don't receive him. You don't allow him to change your life. You're doing the same thing that those Pharisees did. We started with this question. What kind of church is this? You might get asked that this, this week. I want you to be ready for it. What kind of church is this? I want to tell you that this is a church founded on the word of God. This is the church that says the word of God is true. We believe his word is true. And this is a church founded on the person of Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no hope in this world. Without Jesus, there is no hope for a next world. Without Jesus, there is nothing. We believe he is the word of God. We believe is, he, he is the way, the truth, and the life. We believe that he has come to us Jehovah God wrapped in the flesh. That's what kind of church we are. That, that's our orthodoxy. But it's not just what we believe. It's not just our belief system that we put on our website. Hey, this is our statement of faith. No, it's our orthopraxy. We live that out. And this is a church where God is still alive. This is a church where he's still transforming lives. This is a church where people get healed. This is a church where people get delivered from drugs and depression. This is a church where addicts are set free. This is a church where marriages are put back together. This is a church where you find your purpose. This is a church where all things are made new. This is a church where you're not judged by your past, but you're found in Christ. This is that kind of church. That's who we are, Jesus, because of you. 
This is a church where sins are forgiven. This is a church where lives are made new. This is a church where people's sins are washed away. This is a church where people are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of church we are. Are you with us? Are you going to be that kind of church? Are you going to be that kind of New Testament Christian? I want you to stand on your feet. I want to tell you one more time that this is a kind of church where God still works miracles. I'm about to invite you into this altar, but don't you dare just make it a thing you do. God works miracles when you come to Him and you ask Him to. We read it. It's our scripture memory verse that He'll do whatever you ask in His name. He works miracles. That's the kind of church we are. And he wants to work a miracle today. Will you let him? This altar's open. It's open right now. Do you believe it, Redemption Church? Do you believe he will work a miracle? Do you believe that you can live out Jesus? Do you believe it right now in this altar? If you want special prayer in this house, if you want us to pray with you, I want you to come to the first two feet. I can't wait to pray with you. I can't wait to see what the Lord does. Come on, let's seek after God. Why don't you pray this? Why don't you say, God, I want you to change my life. I want you to reveal truth to me. God, I want you to change the way I live. Thank you you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.